In 2004, I lost my daughter, Jessie, four days before her 10th birthday. She was in the hospital for months. There were a series of medical catastrophes following a brain surgery um, culminating in a medication-induced illness called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. She died a terrible death. She spent the last three weeks of her life in the Cornell burn unit in a chemically-induced coma. As you might imagine, I was in the worst shape of my life. Every morning I woke up and it was like, ah, I can't believe I'm still alive. I can't believe I have to drag myself through another day. And every day the answer was the same. Yes, you got to do it. Among other things, the most important reason was I had a 20-year-old son. I had a second child who'd been devastated by the death of his baby sister and who obviously clearly needed his mom. So I wasn't able to commit suicide. Instead, I went into therapy. Now, I'm not the easiest person to fit with a therapist, and not just because I am a therapist. Um, that's always a reason. I'm, I'm a cliche of my baby boomer generation. I'm a queer woman. I'm a lefty, liberal, atheist, hippie, uh, peacenik type. Um, the logical choice for me probably would have been a feminist therapist, a gay woman, a gay man. Instead, I found myself drawn to a guy who had trained me 15 years earlier, who was in many ways my diamond. He was a cliche of the other other side of the baby boomer um, generation. The therapist I picked, Bruce, was um, Midwestern, straight, white guy, conservative, Republican, ex-seminarian, ex-marine. <laughs> right, I know. That was my therapist. <laughs> um, but the reason that I, so, so let me give you a sense of what Bruce is like. He, he, he's tall, he's thin, he's almost gaunt. He's not just white, he's pale. So he's so almost ghostly looking, very severe. Not a, he doesn't come across cold, but he's certainly not a warm fuzzy type, right? He's a rationalist, a realist. He's calm, he's considered, he's measured, right? Sort of like that. And that was part of what appealed to me. He doesn't have a sentimental bone in his body, and I was in no mood for sentimentality. What I needed was to be able to go into a therapist week after week, year after year, and say, still want to die, and have the therapist be able to say, okay, I got it, I understand. Now, it helped that I knew something about Bruce's background. I knew that he was a recovering alcoholic. I knew that he was a Vietnam vet. And so I felt very strongly that, we, that, that one thing that we had in common was that we understood trauma, that both of us, as they say, had seen things that human beings shouldn't have to see. I knew that Bruce had a dark side. And that was really important to me because I was in a really, really dark place for a really, really long time. My spirituality was not a particular comfort to me. I have what I call a no-frills spirituality. I don't believe in a personal God. I don't believe in an afterlife. And I don't believe in a soul that exists after the body dies. So it wasn't like I was thinking, oh, someday I'll see Jesse again. For me, it's like, this is it, and then you die. And, and during that period of time, this is it, was pure pain. Almost every day, I felt, it is not, living is not worth the energy that it's taking me to drag myself through the day. And so week after week, year after year, I would go in and, uh, to see Bruce and I would wail and scream and yell and beat my chair and just wail at the top of my lungs. It got, I cried so much that I would go in and Bruce always had a box of tissues and a waste paper basket right next to my chair. Now, I would cry forever, and during that time, he, pract he pretty much did nothing. He never touched me, never tried to hug me, he never tried to comfort me. And that was really an important thing for me. It's hard to understand, but it was a really important thing. But every once in a while, I would look up when I was done crying, and I would see tears standing in his eyes. And that was really the most comfort I needed. I have a terrific support system. I was not looking for warm fuzzy. That's what I, not what I needed in therapy. 
I needed to be able to express my dark side. I would go in and I would say things like, Bruce, I'm never going to be happy again. And he would say, maybe not. I would say, Bruce, there's part of me that has died and is never going to come alive again. And he would say, that sounds about right, actually, for what you've been through. I would say, Bruce, life fucking sucks. And he'd say, I know what you mean. The Bible is right. Life is a veil of tears. And that was helpful to me. I also was very angry, and, and he was able to join me in my anger as well. I would rage about everything big, little, and in between. One of my pet peeves was people who say, everything happens for a reason. Now, nobody had the nerve to say that to me to my face or to say it about my daughter's death, but you know, you can't help but hear it. People say it all the time, and it would always drive me crazy. I, I'm sure you know what I mean, it would be like, well, three months ago you lost your job, but now you got another one and it's even better. Everything happens for a reason. And I would be there like, you fucking kidding me? Seriously, you're gonna tell me my daughter died for a reason? And I would go in and Bruce would really be able to join me in that. I remember one, one session I went in and I said, Bruce, the next person that says, everything happens for a reason, I am going to put my hands around their neck and I am going to throttle them until they're dead and you're going to have to bail me out of jail. His response, not only will I bail you out of jail, I'll defend you on the grounds of justifiable homicide. <laughs> so the, the most significant session that Bruce and I ever had happened about eight months after my daughter died. Unbeknownst to me, my son, who was away at college, was really much more devastated than even I had realized, and he'd gotten involved in some very self-destructive behavior. One night, I got one of those middle-of-the-night phone calls that parents dread. I'm not going to give you details because I don't want to intrude on his privacy, but just let me say that there was a period of time that it looked very realistic that I mo might lose both of my children. During that time, I went in to see Bruce and I said to him in a session, Bruce, I've thought this through. If Corey dies, I'm checking out. I'm not doing this a second time. And then I proceeded to tell him that I was gonna buy a gun, the details of the plan. I had everything very clearly thought out. Now, if you're a therapist, it's never a fun time to have a client across from you saying they're going to kill themselves. Bruce's response was remarkable. He didn't call 911. He didn't try to talk me into checking into a psych ward. He didn't even make me make one of those contracts that therapists do about staying alive. What he did was he said to me, if your son dies, I really understand why you would kill yourself. I'll be really sad, but I absolutely understand it. At that moment, Bruce was not a therapist and I was not a client. We were meeting each other as two human beings, connected, understanding that there is some pain in life that human beings perhaps shouldn't be expected to bear. And that was a moment that really crystallized everything that was important to me about therapy with Bruce. The story has a happy ending. It's 12 years after my daughter has died. My son is fine. He's getting a PhD in, from Princeton in a couple of months, which he won't be able to do anything with. But still, <laughs> um, still, he's happy. He's having a great time. And I went on a couple of years later to adopt two older girls from a Guatemalan orphanage. Um, they had a whole history of abuse and neglect, and so every day the three of us heal each other. We heal each other. It is true that I'm never going to be as happy as I was when Jesse was alive, and it is true that there is part of me that has died and is never coming back again. But that's not the entire story. I once heard a parent who had lost a child describe their life this way. It's as if the backdrop of my life is painted blue. And that's kind of how I feel, that the backdrop of my life is painted blue. But the foreground these days isn't so bad. And to a large degree, 
I owe a lot of that to Bruce. Thank you very much.